have no idea what I'm doing. What should you do for the rest of us? <laughs>
We rise for the opening dialogue. Mary lovingly poured perfume on the feet of Jesus. Oh Christ Jesus, may our love for you be poured out upon you. Mary lavished Jesus with a costly perfume. Oh Christ Jesus, may our offerings to you be from the heart. Mary used her own hands. The fragrance of Mary's perfume filled the whole house. O oh Christ Jesus, may our lives be lived in an atmosphere of gratitude to you. Almighty God, our Redeemer, in our weakness we have failed to be your messengers of forgiveness and hope in the world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, that we may follow your commands and proclaim your reign of love through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first lesson, a reading from the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I, fo whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. This is the word of the Lord.
The second lesson, a reading from St. Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not one that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know excuse me, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the twelfth chapter. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He cared to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated for a solo that we performed from a CD.
Have you ever had one of those days in your life when there was joy and sorrow, happiness and sadness all at once? A day filled with such conflicting emotions, you found your heart torn between laughter and tears. There was a day like that for a family near Milwaukee, Wisconsin this past year. A terrible midweek accident occurred just outside a small town near Milwaukee, and three young men were killed in a head-on collision. The following Saturday, one of the families had a funeral for one son in the morning and a wedding for another son in the evening. They felt that the son who had been killed would not want his brother's wedding to be postponed on his account. It's difficult to imagine what emotions filled that wedding reception. The son who was buried was, <clears throat> was to have been the best man and was to have given the toast for his brother. Today's gospel tells a story about a dinner party where there must have been a house full of people whose hearts were filled with conflicted emotions. Think about these guests and try to get hold of the many feelings and tensions. First, there's Jesus, who was trying to stay out of the public eye because a plot to have him executed is already hatched. Temple officials have issued a warrant for his arrest. Then there's Lazarus, who has just been raised from the dead. He may or may not have been aware that there was a price on his head. Of course, Mary and Martha are there. They've just gone through the loss of their brother, and then the sudden return from death. And then there is Judas, who is grousing about losing the opportunity for a little embezzlement from the disciple fund. Here is the warm glow of gathering of friends who share the joy and the sorrow of each other's lives. And in this moment, they are saying hello and goodbye. In the world outside, all hell is breaking loose, quite literally. Inside, there is warmth, sharing, the security of love. Except for one thing. There is one who sits as though with friends, whose heart is filled with corruption. The joy and beauty of intimacy ruined by the deceit of a soul gone astray. The irony is striking. The presence of Judas in this gathering is a prime example of why Jesus is here to begin with. Jesus is present as the amazing declaration of God's unconditional forgiving love in the face of unqualified deception. It had to hurt. Judas is fully aware of Jesus' choice to live totally for others. Yet he twists the gift from Mary into a hollow complaint about how the poor could have been helped. It's like the charity begins at home so as to cover his miserly heart that really doesn't want to give anything to anyone. Maybe even more like the weeping TV evangelist who shows pictures of crying, starving children so as to line his own pockets with the gifts from poor widows. Jesus' response to Judas is a counterpoint that Judas could have picked up on if he'd been perceptive enough. You care for the poor, do you, Judas? There will be opportunity enough. Let Mary give her costly gift of love while you cover your deceit with pious platitudes about how you care for the poor. We'll pretty soon see what it is you really care for. The most astounding thing of all is the thought that Jesus is here to love even the deceiver and to long for his return. Since the beginning of time, God has longed to see every wayward child come home to eternal love. The reading from Isaiah shows this pleading love of God, which had been spurned by Israel regularly, almost systematically. God had said to Israel, I hope there is no one else, and still you will not come to me. It is amazing to see an almighty, all pure, 
turning to wayward Israel like a jilted lover. Have you ever experienced the pain of being dumped? God has. The voice of the prophet for this gathering at Lazarus' home goes to the heart of Mary and Martha's dinner party when God declares, I am about to do a new thing. This new thing is present in the midst of this emotional gathering. The Gospel of John comments, Jesus knew that his hour had come. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. The NIV comes closer, I think, to accurately giving us the meaning of unto the end by rendering it this way. He now showed them the full extent of his love. The meaning of the word end here, telos in Greek, frequently communicates the notion of a goal or completion or maybe even perfection. The heart of what is taking place at this amazing gathering is Jesus demonstrating the meaning of perfect love. This is almost too much for human hearts to understand. This is a love powerful enough to encounter deception engage rejection, and still love the deceiver. Is it possible we live in a world where deception is so commonplace that we come to accept it as normal? An NBC Dateline episode showed telemarketing scam artists stealing money from elderly people. One older woman is in tears pleading with a caller who is demanding that she send in a check if she's really the upstanding, honest person she claims to be. So now we have public service announcements that warn especially the elderly not to sign anything you don't understand. But the elderly are not the only targets. The car you want to buy for your college-bound daughter after reading an ad isn't $199 after all. Not if you want an engine and some wheels. Oh, and yes, there's the additional $4,000 for acquisitions fee, capitalization reduction costs, and a few other hidden costs. Then there was an episode on CBS where five heartbroken women all thought they had married their Romeo, who had taken most of their assets and run up countless thousands of dollars on their credit cards. Each one of these women thought she was his one and only until the police caught up with him. The sad thing is we hear these stories and begin to develop a sense of, so what else is new? We're becoming almost accustomed to deceit. A song from uh, from the musical Hair said it well. How can people be so heartless? How can people be so cruel? Easy to be hard. Easy to be cold. And we know that we are not immune from that coldness of the heart. Is there anyone here who has not at one time or another endured the breakdown of a cherished relationship? Someone you cared for deeply turned away from you. A misunderstanding that should should not have mattered came between you. Imagine then what it must have been like for Jesus to spend all night praying about who should be chosen to be his closest associates. He then picks 12 and then totally immerses himself in tutoring them, training them to take over the mission that he has over a three, three and a half year period. And now he sits with one of those 12 knowing full well that this man is not only embezzling funds from the group, but is about to join the conspiracy to have Jesus put to death. Jesus knows Judas will be the one to finger him as a culprit with a false kiss. If it was me, I'd want to say to Judas, you low down good for nothing. The very least you could do is let me have a last bit of fellowship with my true friends. Could you handle that setting? Deception and the breakup or even loss of friendship, that hurts big time. How does Jesus handle it? Well, there are two critical principles at work here. 
principles that can help us through those times when someone we thought cared turned away from us. Principle one would be focus on those who are true friends. Jesus did not allow the deception of Judas to diminish the quality of his relationship with those who were his true friends. That's hard to do, but it's essential. Don't focus on what's gone. Focus on what is left. There is still this evening with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Now, if you're anything like me, it's easy to let negative things drain your energy. Jesus does just the opposite. The negative is devalued, and the positive is revalued. It's the old question. Is the glass half empty or half full? Well, because Jesus was always tuned in to his father, what his father wanted from him and what his father gave to him, he was a full cup person. Not half full, full full. So principle two, do not engage the deceiver, that's with a capital D now, on his turf. Keep distance from the temptation to fight it out with the person who was turned away. Judas already had an agenda. His heart had turned away from Jesus and he was seeking justification to do what he was going to do because his mind was made up. He never came to Jesus with any questions or difficulties he had. So Jesus does not waste his time in debate or argument or even venting his anger. That would drain his own time and energy. Save that. Save it for the good things of your life. Life is way too short to spend it on the deceiver's agenda. Because here's what the deceiver wants. Satan wants to draw us away from God. If he can mess up some of our relationships to do that, He'll try for every relationship we have. Anything he can God is for him a victory. Remember how I said that Jesus was always tuned into what his father wanted from him and gave to him? That's where we need to be. Paul says it this way in today's second lesson. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in death. To know Christ is more than to know about him. It is to become more deeply immersed in him. As you get to know him deeply, passionately, ardently, the deceiver will be less and less able to get at you. Because in this, as in all else, Jesus is with you in the thick of things. So, brothers and sisters, press on to the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise for the hymn for the day. i
snares I have already come tis great me save thus far and grace will lead me home the Lord has promised good to me his word my hope seek he will my shield and portion me as long as life endures. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people that by repentance the Lord may draw us close to himself. In these Latin days, remove from us all impenitence and unbelief and keep us united to Christ Make all your people be of one mind and spirit, joyfully proclaiming the love of Christ Jesus. Protect us from the power of the evil one, and pour out the fullness of your spirit on our lives, that we may make the bold confession that Jesus is Lord. Lord of the nations, give to all our public servants wisdom and understanding, that in difficult decisions and deliberations, they may be moved to act in honor and strive to serve the common good. Sustain all who labor to protect us, especially the member of our armed forces. Keep them from harm, lift their spirits, and bless their efforts. We commend to you, to your community and community. Give you parents wisdom to know how best to guide their children so that these young ones may grow up trusting in you and leading lives that please you. Help all our children to honor their parents as gifts from you. We remember before you, Heavenly Father, the sick, the suffering, the lonely, the dying, the grieving, and all those who desire our prayers. Heal those with infirmities, strengthen those who are struggling, and send comfort and peace to those who mourn. God over all, look in love on this world and all its people as we commit them to you in the words our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Sleeping, 
peace from our neglected Oh, uh-huh. 